Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, can you hear me? Turn this up a bit. Hello. Okay, now you can definitely hear me. Okay. Once again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first Hyatt Fund event of the spring 2010 semester. My name is Tariq Downey, and I'll be moderating this event this evening. The Black Law Students Association is proud to host this most timely and relevant discussion on profiling, policy, and police conduct in a post-9-11 society. As I previously mentioned, this event was made possible by the Hyde Student Activities Fund, which provides student organizations with funding to bring distinguished speakers to the law school and to support student-initiated activities that will enrich the law student, the law student body and spur intellectual development. The Black Law Students Association recognizes the importance of diversity education and in hosting this panel, we hope to provide the Vanderbilt community with more knowledge and an increased understanding of these issues. Before we get started, there are a few ground rules. First, I will present the questions to our panelists. Any panelist may address any question. Once a panelist has addressed a question, we will take questions from the audience if that response has spurred a question from the audience. We will not address unrelated questions unless the designated, until the designated time, which will be at approximately 6.45. The time is now 6.09. <laughs> <laughs> Synchronized watches. Very military, yes. very military-like there. <laughs> <laughs> at that time, we will address all questions from the audience. Once again, if a response from our panelists spurs a question, feel free to raise your hand and approach do we have microphones? Well, we, well, they are microphones. There's one to your rear, my left, your right, and your left, my right. So it's on both sides. Um, and raise your hand and approach the mic and address the panelists. I will now introduce our distinguished panelists. Starting from my left, we have our first panelist, which is David Singleton, who is the executive director of the Ohio Justice and Policy Center, a nonprofit organization seeking to reform Ohio's justice system. He received his JD cum laude from Harvard University, and he also teaches a seminar on constitutional issues in criminal justice at Northern Kentucky University College of Law. Our next panelist is Reginald Shufford. Shufford, my apologies. Uh, he's senior counsel at the American Civil Liberties Union, and he received his JD from the University of North Carolina. He now leads the ACLU and he leads the racial profiling litigation efforts of the American Civil Liberties Union. He writes and speaks regularly on the issue of racial profiling and has appeared in numerous radio and television shows. Last, but certainly not least, we have our very own Professor Christopher Slobogan, who is the director of the criminal justice program here at the law school and was recently inducted as the Milton Underwood Professor of Law. Professor Slobogan received his JD and LLM from the University of Virginia. He's an expert in criminal procedure and mental health law and evidence law. He has authored or co-authored more than 70 articles, books, and chapters on the topics and is one of the 20 most cited criminal law and procedural law professors in the country. Please give, give a hand to the distinguished. Now I will ask each panelist to briefly state their reasons for agreeing to the panel to appear on the panel and to speak freely on the issues, the aforementioned issues. You will have five minutes. We'll, we'll start with Mr. Singleton. Well, thanks for having um, us here. I'm delighted to present and to talk about these issues. At the Ohio Justice and Policy Center, we focus on criminal justice reform. We represent folks who are incarcerated. We represent folks coming out of prison, um, trying to help them get on their feet and be productive members of the community. But we also do a lot of work on the front end of uh, the criminal justice system. Um, uh, in addition to our school to prison pipeline work, we focus um, uh, some of our resources on racial profiling issues. So um, I am here to talk about my experience in Ohio, but it's not just my experience as um, someone who litigates these cases and thinks about the broader policy issues. You know, I've been profiled myself several times, pre-9-11, um, post-9-11, and um, it's, uh, I, I have some very personal feelings um, about 
uh, profiling based on that. I think it's legally, morally wrong to, 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 uh, to stop people solely based on their race. Um, but in addition to those concerns, do we really make ourselves safer? And I think that we live in a society uh, where we, are, we all want safety. We can all find common ground around that um, concern, whether we're black, white, Republican, um, Democrat, conservative, liberal, however we identify ourselves. We want safety. But often when we are most afraid, we uh, do things that are counterproductive. And in my community of Cincinnati, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, there is major distrust in the African American uh, community of the police. And there are crimes that go unsolved in that community because folks feel like the police are not their friends, that they are always the targets, that they are stopped uh, um, based solely on their race. And does that make us safer in Cincinnati? Um, I don't think so. So I think we always have to keep in mind that um, while we might uh, feel like we can accept um, uh, certain uh, police tactics because we all want to be safe and we're afraid, there's a question about whether that really does accomplish the safety that we're after. So that's what I wanted to say to start. Thank awesome. you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for allowing me to be here uh, as well this evening. Um, so I think the the Black. question is essentially why, why are we here? <laughs> and you know, I'm here for a number of reasons. Number one, because notwithstanding you know, proclamations of a post-racial society, the reality is that we are not, not in one. Racial discrimination and racial profiling continue to happen. I'm here um, on behalf of countless, nameless, uh, individuals who have been the victims of racial profiling, including many of my clients. I'm here on behalf of um, Sergeant Rosano Gerald and his 12-year-old son Gregory, 12 at the time, who were traveling for a family reunion from Maryland to Oklahoma, were stopped a very, very hot August Oklahoma day and racially profiled, detained for an hour and a half, um, um, allegedly for not signaling when changing lanes. Um, which necessitated um, a second car, a canine car, coming up. Sergeant Gerald, who had spent the majority of his adult life in the Army at that point, was separated from his 12-year-old son, handcuffed. Um, Gregory, the son, was placed in the second car with the dog. Um, Gregory was in the front, the dog, a big German shepherd, barking, growling, salivating at, on Gregory. And obviously nothing was found. I'm here on behalf of them and have learned two things in particular from that experience that I'll never forget. The first um, thing um, that Sergeant Gerald told me was, uh, over the course of my representation of him, um, was to point out the irony of um, having spent years abroad, the majority of his adult life, um, representing American notions of democracy and fairness, et cetera, around the world, but to come back to his own country and be made to feel like a second-class citizen. So I'm here on his behalf and on behalf of his son, who, the second point, was that when Gregory, his only child, was a baby, he held him in his arms and said, the one thing that I can always guarantee you is that I will always protect you. And when he was separated from Gregory and unable to see where Gregory was, he felt though it wasn't his fault, that he had let his son down, that he had broken his promise to his only son. I'm here on behalf of Raya Girard, who in August 2006 was um, attempting to fly from JFK to LA back home. And it was wearing, Raya Girard is um, an Iraqi born um, resident now of the US, um, but clearly um, Arab in appearance. Um, who was an activist, um, primarily um, something that didn't exist back, back in the day, but now is a, an internet activist, if you will, among other things, who was wearing a t-shirt that said, we will not be silent, in both Arabic and English subscript. Um, he was forbidden from boarding that JetBlue flight that day. He was told by a TSA uh, officer that um, to wear such a shirt on a plane is, a, is akin to 
going to a bank and saying, I'm a bank robber. Not only was he not allowed to fly with that shirt and made to wear another shirt, his seat was moved from the very front of the plane to the very back of the bathroom, and he was told that he needed to surrender his seat in order to accommodate a mother and child traveling together. We subsequently learned in discovery that that was not reality. I'm here on behalf of Latino men in Virginia, four who were congregated in their neighborhood and accused of laudar laudering and trespass merely because they were standing around in their neighborhood. I'm here on behalf of Jordan Miles, an 18-year-old violinist who recently was beaten by three white undercover police officers in Pittsburgh um, who accused him of having a gun under his coat. But in reality, if anything, it was a, a soda bottle, and that is not necessarily proven fact either. I'm here because racial profiling is proven over and over again to be ineffective, it doesn't work, it's counterproductive, it undermines law enforcement uh, uh, efficacy, um, it's immoral, it's contra it contravenes strongly, closely held notions of equality and fair play, um, and it's illegal. It violates the Constitution and other statutory provisions. Um, um, I'm also here, I'm a Southern boy, so it would be remiss of me to not um, thank um, Tariq for having me. I'm here at his invitation on the invitation of BALSA and the law school, so I look forward to having this conversation with you. All righty, thank you. Thanks. Well, I'm honored to be on the same panel as David and Reggie. Um, and I have to say I don't have the experience that they've had, either personally in terms of racial profiling or in terms of representing clients who have, who have been affected by racial profiling. And so I'm going to actually approach this from a slightly different angle. I am very interested in racial profiling, and I have something to say about it. But for my introductory remarks, I want to talk about profiling more generally. But I do want to mention before I talk about profiling more generally that I have been profiled once, way back when, when I had a beard, long hair, and a backpack. I was stopped precisely for those reasons and for no other. And so that's a form of profiling as well. It's, I wasn't routinely subjected to profiling. and did not have the kind of experience that I think a lot of um, people who are African-American or Latino have in this country on a routine basis. But I have a little bit of a sense of what it's like. Um, so uh, I want to describe that experience briefly. But what I mostly want to do in these introductory remarks is talk about profiling generally. And I think it's important to realize that police profile all the time. They don't always use race. In fact, quite often they use other kinds of criteria. One could argue that they are profiling any time they stop anyone for something short of a crime. In other words, any time they engage in preventive policing. Many of you know about the case of Terry versus Ohio, a very famous case back in 1967 decided by the Supreme Court. And many of you may remember the facts of that case. Officer McFadden, on his patrol, saw two different individuals walking in front of a storefront 24 times, and then occasionally confer with a third person, um, and then go back and check out the storefront again. He ended up stopping those three individuals, frisking two of them, and the case eventually got to the United States Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court said it was permissible for Officer McFadden to stop and frisk these individuals. Now, what was the basis for Officer McFadden's action? It was a profile. He was concluding that anyone who walked in front of a storefront 24 times must be up to no good, must be thinking about burglarizing that place or doing something else that would involve wrongdoing. If he had retired at that point, and gone to the academy to teach recruits. He might have taught them a class about what to look for when you're looking for burglars. And he would, might have mentioned this kind of activity. The recruits would have written those words down, and their notes would have essentially been a profile. This is a profile of an incipient burglar. And what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that conceptually there's not much of a difference between what Officer McFadden does and some of the racial profiling case did and what some of the racial profiling cases involve. Though in Terry, arguably, race was not involved. Other criteria were. And there's arguably a problem with that kind of profiling, as well as with racial profiling. I want to mention three other kinds of examples, which sound a little bit different than what happened in Terry versus Ohio, but nonetheless help make the point I'm making. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, we had a number of planes that were hijacked, believe it or not. Uh, I know we've been focused on hijacking recently, but, but it was relatively routine, unfortunately, back in the 60s and 70s. The federal government wanted to do something about it, so they came up with a hijacker profile. And the way they came up with this profile is they looked very closely at 30 known hijackers and determined what kinds of 
variables, what kinds of characteristics these 30 individuals had, and came up with a profile that represented what the normal average hijacker looked like. They then applied it to over a three quarter of a million airplane passengers. They identified 1,500 people who met the profile, and 4% of these, or about 40 people, were actually denied boarding based on the profile. So that's one kind of profile, a hijacker profile, not based on race. Um, I happen to know because I know what the criteria are, though I'm not allowed to reveal them upon pain of death, but, uh, but based on factors that are short of crime. None of these factors were crimes in and of themselves, and that's one possible definition of a profile, a, a set of characteristics, none of which are crime in and of themselves, but conceivably correlate with crime. Then another example, in the 70s and 80s, a number of federal and state police departments developed drug career profiles, and you've probably all heard about this. Um, these drug career profiles were nowhere near as scientific as the hijacker profiles, I think it's safe to say. The hijacker profiles in and of themselves were not very scientific, but at least they made an attempt to be relatively reliable in the way they came up with the characteristics, and they did cross-validate it on another sample. Well, these drug career profiles didn't come close to being the kind of profiles that the hijacker profiles were. So, for instance, as Justice Marshall pointed out in United States versus Sokolow, some of these profiles fixate, and these all, by the way, applied in airports, uh, at least initially. Justice Marshall pointed out that some of these profiles uh, listed as a key factor the fact that the individual was the first to get off the plane. Others listed as a key factor that he was the last person to get off the plane. Others that he got off in the middle of the crowd, and others that he got off a quarter of the way through. Well, immediately you suspect that there's something else going on here behind, besides a scientific approach to profiling. Some emphasize no luggage, some emphasize brand new suitcases, some emphasize gym bags. You get the point. They were sort of made up as the police went along, basically an ex post rationalization for the kind of thing they did. These were all, however, denominated as, as profiles. So it's another kind of profile. Um, third kind of profile, and then I'm going to stop. But the third kind of profile I think it's worth talking about um, is something that's, uh, that's come along since 9-11. And part of our title has to do with 9-11 something called total information awareness. It was the brainchild of Admiral Poindexter, you may remember him. Uh, it was designed to designate terrorists, but what it involved was accumulating information about all of us, literally billions of records, financial records, medical records, travel records, um, housing records, and even veterinarian records. And then once all this information was accumulated, a quote unquote terrorist profile was to be applied to this information to see who deserves special attention. Uh, this program, TIA, Total Information Awareness, and the name in and of itself is scary enough, um, was defunded in 2003, but it still exists in various forms. One reason it was defunded is because it didn't catch too many terrorists. In addition, it also violated privacy in a major way. Um, so, the one point I want to make, and then we'll get on to the questions, is that I don't think there's any conceptual difference between what Officer McFadden did in Terry versus Ohio and these other kinds of profiles. In all of these situations, the police are relying on factors that are not in and of themselves crimes in order to try to prevent crime from occurring. One common characteristic of all these profiles is that they are not very good, and that's already been alluded to by David and Reggie, that that police often make mistakes applying these profiles. So one thing I think we're going to talk about today is whether it's based on race or not, whether it's partially based on race or not, whether we should ever profile, whether it's ever permissible to engage in preventive policing, and if so, under what circumstances. And that is a beautiful segue to the first question. Um, is there ever a time where profiling is acceptable, e.g. profiling behavior at the airport, um, as you alluded to earlier? And you can answer this in any order. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I don't have a problem with what Officer McFadden did. Um, that seems to me to be um, uh, very specific information that he had that, uh, that would make most of us, in a common, just applying common sense, think that something's about to happen. They're casing the joint. If, there's not, if, there, if, if that is not casing the joint, what is, right? Um, when, but when I am walking down the street, um, I used to live in New York City. I lived uh, up near Columbia University in a sort of a rough patch uh, up there on Amsterdam Avenue. And the police are jumping out of their cars and 
pull and asking every black man they see to stop, including me, and saying and, and asking and, and starting actually to search me. And I'm like, look, I just came off the train. I just came from this conference in DC. What are you doing to me? I'm a lawyer. Leave me alone. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't have a crystal ball. I could not see that. I don't know that information. That was th what the officer told me. That's not right. And I, that much I know. And that was based, you now maybe they would say that my presence in a high crime neighborhood, being a black man and applying their common sense, knowing that, that, that crime happened in that, in that community, and that, um, uh, that um, uh, often the crime that happened in that community um, involved brown and, 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 and black folks, not exclusively. Um, maybe they would say that those combination of facts um, were reasonable to give them um, some basis to stop me. Well, legally, I don't think they would have had um, any ground to stand on. But that is not right. And, um, you know, I think the, the rub is, is, is trying to figure out the more difficult cases in the middle. Um, because I think we all would say that certain common sense ought to be applied, but it ought to not be driven mostly by somebody's race or stereotypes. Or stereotypes. Um, I, I have no problem with what Officer McFadden did either. I just wanted to point out that um, I think he was profiling just like yes. the place you're talking about, profiling just like what happens at airports. The reason I have no problem with what Officer McFadden did is I think there was a very high correlation yes. between what he saw and incipient crime, whereas there's a much lower correlation in the kind of situation you're talking about. And that, I think, is what we need to grapple with, is when we have a profile that's pretty good at what it does, and when we don't. The problem, the reason I started with Austin McFadden is, first of all, I think it may not have been immediately obvious that he was profiling. But secondly, of course, as you know, Terry versus Ohio ended up authorizing stops and frisks. And that's what it happens to you in New York. Uh, Terry authorized at least a... He's left New York. He's right now, it's all you sorry, now. Sorry. You in New York. <laughs> um, to me now. And, so as you all know, if, if you've taken criminal procedure, Terry Ohio allows a stop, which is short of an arrest, based on something called reasonable suspicion, which is short of the probable cause you need for arrest. Well, we still don't know what reasonable suspicion is exactly. It's not probable cause, which is what you need for arrest. It's not just a hunch. It has to be something that's articulable. But what, how much articulation do you need before you can stop someone? And even though I agree that Officer McFadden operated uh, appropriately, there's some very interesting research that comes out of New York, you may know about this, um, which analyzed 175,000 pedestrian stops. In other words, 175,000 Officer McFadden stops based on reasonable suspicion. Um, only 2% of the people stopped during this 15-month period, these 175,000 people, ended up being arrested. 2% out of 175,000. Now, that's not a very good profile. If, if they're basing it on something, my guess is on race quite often, but maybe not on race sometimes, maybe on other kinds of stereotypes, and they're wrong 98% of the time. I think that's a huge problem. And so the question becomes, do we stop this entirely? And some people would. They would say, unless you've got grounds to arrest someone, unless you've got probable cause, you may not stop anyone. Partly for the reasons that David and Reggie alluded to earlier, that it, it uh, creates mistrust between especially minority communities in the government, and there may be some other reasons as well. Because uh, even a, a non-African American might be affronted by this kind of thing. Um, so we could stop them completely, or we could be much more serious about when the cops are wrong. They're wrong an awful lot, and apparently they don't seem to care because they're wrong 98% of the time. So maybe we should be much more serious about identifying when they're wrong and doing something to them when they are wrong. For instance, not just excluding evidence, because a lot of times they never prosecute these people. So exclusion is a non-issue for them, right? If a person is never taken to court, you never, the cop never has to worry about exclusion. In the meantime, he's managed to harass somebody and maybe remove some drugs or guns from the street or maybe just asserted his presence in the community. So exclusion might not be a good remedy. Maybe damages. Maybe we should actually make cops pay out of their pocket when it can be shown they did not have reasonable suspicion or the reasonable suspicion was based on part on race, or in part on race. That might send a very strong message to cops. The various other kinds of solutions we might be able to come up with, which I will save for later. But, but I, I wanted to pick up on what David was talking about in terms of the New York stops. There is no fear of putting cops financially liable. For, that would over deter. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that, I don't think the courts are going to be heading in that direction any, anytime soon. 
in fact, there are all these built-in uh, legalisms and qualified immunity, et cetera, that prevent that very thing. And I think it does. Um, it does decrease accountability. It's like, why do they have to be accountable for 98 percent of the time that they're wrong when there is nothing, no consequence that is um, that they're being made to feel? As someone who has experienced and lived profiling, um, but has also advocated around the issue for over a decade at this point, I'm loath to um, to say that I at all in any form or fashion support profiling. If I'm forced into a corner, it's, I might say that a profile that is based on behavior is certainly more palatable to me than one that is based upon race and or stereotype. For example, um, in, this, in the context of the Christmas Day underwear bomber or whatever they're calling it these days, um, without detailing every single fact, there were some facts that made him suspicious, right? There was intelligence about those suspicions and those facts. You didn't need to racially profile him. All you needed to do was share that information and that intelligence among agencies. President Obama said the failure there was not because you know, racial profiling wasn't available, but because you didn't share information. You didn't connect the dots. I don't, if you, if behavior is legitimately suspicious, then I, for example, who have flown five to ten times over the past two weeks, damn well want you to use that information to protect me when I'm flying. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I, no one wants you to dispense with common sense. But we want you to do things that work and that are effective, are legitimate, um, and that are legal. Racial profiling has been shown over and over again to not satisfy any of that criteria. Um, and then again, as the, the Christmas bomber um, demonstrates, it's not necessary. It wouldn't have been necessary in that context. And in fact, it, I dare say it wouldn't have helped at all um, in that scenario. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Um, along the lines of, I would believe, ethnic profiling, which would be more akin to what happened with the Christmas Christmas bomber. Um, do you think that post 9-11, like that type of profiling will be more permissible or do you think it's it's just more pervasive? As in, you have the, I'm getting a little flustered here. My apologies. Good. Okay. So at what point does it become Profiling to a specific, I mean, David, you mentioned that it's specifics. If you have specific behavior and specific things that you're looking for, but how specific do you get when it be, until it becomes some kind of violation? Let's say if you look at someone that wears a hijab or if, you, if someone that's Muslim or practices Islam or, or something to that effect, when do you get that specific before it violates the Constitution, Fourth That's Amendment? Appearance Fifth Amendment. and not behavior, in my opinion, based upon okay. the hypo. Okay. And again, appearance is, in my opinion, impermissible. It's an impermissible, impermissible basis upon which to do some type of police intervention against somebody. With respect to your earlier question about post 9-11, well, the reality is that, yes, <laughs> it's happening more. It's happening with respect to a certain category of people more so than other people. But don't, let's not fool ourselves into believing that other categories of people are no longer profiled. I mean, there's profiling going on as everywhere we as we speak in immigrant communities, against Latinos, against South Asians, certainly against Arabs and Muslims, et cetera, and against African Americans continually. It's still happening, but certainly post 9-11, um, the, the publicity, for lack of a better term, concentrated on Arabs, Arabs and Muslims. Um, and I, I think that there's no doubt that it's, the increase was in, in part the result of a more concentrated effort to do so. But I would, I would also submit that it happened more because it was either implicitly or explicitly consented to by the American people. I think that certain politicians played the fear card 
um, and ran rapid with the little bit of leeway that frightened, legitimately frightened Americans and citizens were experiencing and sort of went crazy. You know, give them a little bit of flexibility to do what you think is going to be essential to protecting us all and then end up creating something like the Total Information Society where you're not satisfied with information about potential like air, airline um, hijackers, but you want information on all of us. And um, I think my point then is that we, are some, we have been complicit to some degree in this expansion of profiling post 9-11. And I would also say um, um, in the area of immigrant profiling as well. And I, I just want to add one point, and you know, courts, I'm not going to speak to specific um, court cases, but courts, generally speaking, um, are very, very sensitive to the emotional temperature that's um, going on in the community. Um, and I mean, when I was in law school, I was naive, and I thought that there are these principles, and courts apply them, and that's not the way it works in the real world. Now, I'm not saying that, doesn't ever, that courts aren't ever doing the right thing. No, they do the right thing. Um, but more often than not, in the work I do, um, courts are very much play into the fear, um, the, f the, the fear card. And it's federal court. It's not just the elected state court judges. And so the climate on the bench is, generally speaking, not very um, um, receptive to the position that I would, that I would take and that um, Reggie would take about uh, these issues. Okay, Professor Slogan, would you like um, to address? Yeah, I guess picking up on a couple things that Reggie and David talked about, um, as I was, and also picking up on something I said earlier, um, it's rare that you're going to get a good profile. That is one that's right more often than not, or even right one out of three times. And one reason for that is the base rate behavior that we're going after, whether it's a terrorist trying to blow up an airplane, or even possession of drugs, is extremely low. And when you have a low base rate for behavior, your profiles are never going to be real good because there's so few people engaging in the behavior you're trying to discover. So that's a real problem. Uh, we could try to make profiles better, but it's going to be very hard to make profiles real good. I mean, that 2% that rate can be improved upon, but we're never going to get to 50% or probably never even 30%, especially with respect to terrorists because there are so few of them that we're, we're rarely going to be able to be very good. So another possibility is to prevent profiling or figure out what kind of profiling we would allow or not allow. And we might be much more willing to allow certain kinds of preventive techniques, certain kind of profiling, profiling techniques than others. For instance, when we're talking about a plane getting blown out of the sky, even though the chances of that are infinitesimally small, given the magnitude of the harm, we might be much more willing to put up with profiling than allow profiling in connection with getting someone for drug possession or drug sale, um, the kind of thing that happens every day on the streets. Um, we might be less willing to put up with mistakes in that latter situation because the harm to society isn't all that great and also because of what this panel is all about because there's a much greater likelihood of racial po profiling, I think, in connection with drug possession crimes than with any terrorism initiatives. However, there's also a possibility of racial profiling with respect to any terrorism initiatives. So what do we do about that? And here I think it's very important to emphasize what Reggie and David have both said, that race as it turns out, because some people are going to not agree that using race is unconstitutional when you have knowledge that most terrorists are going to be either Muslim or Middle Eastern or a combination of both. And that many people who engage in drug trade are African American. Certainly not all, but many. They're just not going to buy that argument. I think it's wrong. I agree with David and Reggie that this should not be consideration, but that's going to be a hard argument to make. So what's the next argument for those people, those legislators, and maybe those courts, because they are politically sensitive? It doesn't work. Race is not an effective way of figuring out who's a terrorist or who's going to possess drugs. And I've got some data to back that up. Okay. Many people believe that if we're going to have an anti-terrorist profile, Middle Eastern descent, ethnicity, should be part of that profile, given our knowledge of what's going on in the past. But think about it. The underpants exploder was Nigerian. Okay. The single most dangerous terrorist that we have had on U.S. soil was Jose Padilla. Guess what? He's not Middle Eastern. Okay, he's Latino. In fact, the chances of a terrorist these days being not from the Middle East is very high. 
First of all, because they know what our profiling is like, and they can recruit people who are not Middle Eastern. So it's a mistake, and arguably a very bad mistake, to use that as one of our criteria. In fact, it might distract us from the criteria we should be using in airports and other places. The Israelis, who have to deal with this all the time, don't use ethnicity or race in deciding who to stop at airports. They use behaviors of the type Reggie was talking about. Because terrorists, for instance, are very highly stressed out. If they're about to get on the plane, I mean, not surprisingly, but they're normal in that sense. About to die, I mean. Yeah. 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 Right, so there's a very high stress level, okay? Um, they also are trying to avoid detection in various ways. And the Israelis have become very good and nuanced at figuring out what kinds of behaviors, not stereotypes, not uh, appearances, but behaviors correlate with terrorism. And that's what they use in their airports. And we've actually hired one of these Israeli folks to work in Boston, Logan, Boston's Logan Airport to help out with behavioral profiling there. Much more effective, in addition to much more constitutional, than using race. Now, also in the streets, there's very interesting research on the extent to which race correlates with possession of drugs. It is a fact, as David was alluding to, that a disproportionate number of African Americans are stopped and asked to consent to searches of their person or their car um, for drugs. African Americans are singled out disproportionately, and then Latinos come in second and whites are last. Well, most cops think, that, most cops think that's commonsensical, that that's the thing they should be doing. But in fact, the data show that race negatively correlates with drug possession. Okay, that actually it detracts from the accuracy of the stops. That they're less likely to find drugs in the car of an African American who's consented to that search than in the car of a white person. Now why is that? It's not necessarily because whites use more drugs, so that might be part of the reason. It's partly because they ask so many blacks for consent that they're automatically going to be wrong more often because the base rate, as I mentioned before, for drug possession is so low. So one possible solution, in addition to some of the others we've talked about, is tell cops this. Okay? So they, they are, I mean, you know, they're not evil people necessarily, and they will respond to comments, you know, you are wrong most of the time when you're using race as a factor. You're actually going to be more wrong when you use race factor than when you, when you don't use it. And conceivably, that would be one way of approaching this. There's actually a prosecutor in Michigan who has now told his cops, knowing this information, then unless you had reasonable suspicion to stop the guy in the first place, I'm not going to admit into evidence any contraband that you discover as a result of a consent search. Because I think it will probably be based on racial profiling. I know, can I just add one point? Oh, sure. I, 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 know, I know, Reggie, you would agree with me on this. Um, what is very important is to educate the community about these issues, not just the police, but the community, because if the community can understand that um, we're talking about tactics that are often going to be counterproductive and not effective, and you can really hammer that point home, th then it's more likely that you can get some change to happen. I think that's right. I think, I think it does depend on like, the messenger, too. In fact, if you're actually going directly to the police officers themselves. They haven't been thrilled to see me, generally. <laughs> They see ACLU and they're like, okay, we don't trust anything you have to say. But there is so much data to support your position about the negative correlation between chronality, drug use in particular. Um, it, hasn't re it, ha it hasn't resonated with well, it. Well, you know, Frank, that's not totally true. I, there was a point at which it was going, it was, it was arriving at the point where it was resonating publicly. And so 2000, et cetera we had reached a national consensus about racial profiling being wrong, ineffective, et cetera. And we're ready to do something to, about it to make it illegal on a f federal level. But then 9-11 happened, and that sort of threw everything out the door. It really, really did. It's almost as if we had to start from scratch with everything that we had achieved. Um, but, but yeah, no, I, I, but there's study after study after study that says African Americans, um, possess, transport, et cetera, drugs much less frequently than their white counterparts. And it's been the basis of litigation that I have done. It has resonated to some degree with courts. Um, but, you know, law enforcement uh, agencies have responded to some degree with, you know, a battle of the experts or criticizing our methodology and our analysis and so on. 
But I think particularly in an economically depressed, depressing time, um, when you demonstrate that things aren't working effectively and you have limited resources and this stuff costs a lot of money, then that is the time when you're more likely to make some progress and, and sort of And you as potential litigants um, need to not just think about what do I bring in terms of um, the ability to litigate a case, but what are the other tools that I have to um, change the conversation? That is really fundamentally important. It's not something I learned in law school, um, but when you're out there practicing and hitting your head against the wall in the courts, you've got to figure out other tactics and be flexible, and um, that includes a media strategy and a public education strategy. Excellent answers, gentlemen. I do have uh, one comment before we open it up to the audience. Now, profiling, as you mentioned, it is, is, is a very uh, serious issue and, and it's taking place on a national level. But to what extent do the individual states regulate or mandate what can and cannot be done as far as what can be done to profile versus the individual law enforcement agency in a county, in a particular county, versus what is acceptable nationally? Is there federal laws that say you cannot do a certain thing in a profile? Not necessarily a search, but just a stop and frisk, as we mentioned earlier with Terry versus the Ohio. I think, it, um, I think it varies from state to state. Okay. There is not a federal law that prohibits racial profiling. Um, ERPA, the Interracial Profiling Act, was introduced initially never went anywhere. It's poised again to be reintroduced. Certainly it was before Christmas um, and before Massachusetts. And anyway, I, I... All bets are off on anything I, I now. digress. <laughs> I digress. Um, but um, notwithstanding the lack of a federal law, a federal law to prohibit racial profiling, obviously there are, there's the Constitution and the 14th Amendment and the 4th Amendment and so on and so forth. Title VI that would be implicated if in, 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 the, in the lawsuit. Um, but states, I think to date, there are 13 states that have anti-profiling legislation on the books. Um, and then beyond that, there are hundreds and thousands of police departments that themselves have said, we are not going to profile. They voluntarily assumed um, um, you know, policies that prohibit profiling. Um, and then thousands that collect data, hundreds of thousands that collect data, and so on and so forth. But it varies from state to state and then from municipality to municipality. I, I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. Yeah, did, um, does anyone else want to add to that? Uh, Professor Sabogan? Well, I guess one thing I'll add is that what Reggie was just talking about has been extremely useful because even though we, we don't have nationwide legislation, and there is variation from state to state. Because of the legislation that does exist, we've accumulated a lot of the information I was referring to earlier. So we know racial profiling goes on. We have objective data to that effect, and we also know it's not effective. And so we have information we can give policymakers and chiefs of police and so on. And it's really important to do this. I agree with David that the messenger has to be the right person. You have to have someone who's credible with the police. But assuming you can get the right messenger, in front of the police and give the police this information. I happen to believe, this may be naive of me, I happen to police, uh, believe the police will respond in an appropriate manner. Because as Reggie said, they got limited resources. And if they can be shown that something's not effective, I think they will stop doing it, or at least um, curtail their illegitimate behavior. But they have to be convinced that it's ineffective. One example of how hard it is to convince them of that is there's a famous case out of Maryland where there was clear evidence of racial profiling. My case. Yes, your case. Do you want to tell them about it? No, you know more about it than I do. No, I forget. This I is forget. a great case. I want you to tell them. Well, um, <laughs> no, I'll just very I'm not, briefly tell you. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll chime in if I remember. Yeah, and I might even get it wrong. That's why I'm gulping here. Maybe I... Well, because it's wrong but, in, the, uh, in the flattering light. I'm not... Well, um... Anyway, the court issued an injunction telling the police you may not use race as a criterion for stopping people. So that was the injunction the police were operating under. And they knew that there was a record going to be kept of who they stopped and what their racial and other characteristics were. 
despite that fact of, and this, you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, of the 732 citizens detained and searched by the Maryland State Police after this injunction was issued for traffic violations from January 95 to, through June 96, 75 percent were still African American, and 5 percent were Hispanic. These are cops who were told not to do this and knew that what they did was going to be recorded, and they still did this. Well, not only and, that, but, they, were okay. re they were required to keep the data. Yeah, they themselves were required to keep that the data. data over to us. So they, so they obviously, and let me finish with the statistics. Of the 12 officers involved in such stops, six stopped over 80 percent African Americans, one stopped over 95 percent African Americans, and two stopped only African Americans. And this Find is under the circumstances. Find depositions. Yes. Now, what's right. going on here? They think, I, I don't think they're totally evil. or to, I think they are racist, but I don't think they're totally evil. I think they are convinced this is an effective way of stopping the drug trade. I think the only way we're going to get through to these people, other than maybe a damages regime, which actually, which actually makes them pay money, say, look, this is not working, OK? It is true that you do get some people. You're going to luck out sometimes. But overall, you're going to be wrong way more often than you're right. And you're wasting resources when you do this kind of thing. Now, the other option, of course, is to fire these guys. But my guess is they'll be replaced by people who are similar. So education is important. I happen to think some kind of regime that's more than the exclusionary rule, which would make the cop pay if he's acting in bad faith. And if he's not acting in bad faith, then we can't prove that. And you all know as litigators it's hard to prove that. Make the department pay regardless if there's not reasonable suspicion. Somewhere there's going to be some change. I, so. <clears throat> the police departments have been made to pay. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't get to the level of the individual line. True. I think they, the police should have to pay if it's bad faith. And I don't think there should be any uh, immunity. And in fact, even the court's current decisions only allow qualified immunity, which means if they act in bad faith, they are personally liable. Right. Though this, the department may indemnify them, I'm totally against a ban on indemnification. I mean, I'm for a ban on indemnification. <clears throat> All right, thank you, gentlemen. At this time, we will take questions from the, from the audience. Carly. Um, I just had a question, and for anyone to answer, um, about the state of 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 the Claims generally are equal protection, which requires improving, requires proven intentional discrimination, which the courts have made almost impossible to do. But sometimes you can do it. Sometimes you can get a, sometimes there's a smoking gun. There's a, um, a couple of very brazen police chiefs have admitted to using racial profiling. In fact, the police chief in Homer, Louisiana said he wants African American men to feel afraid um, of being arrested whenever they come to Homer, Louisiana. So people are really sort of bold about that. And, and, and when you have people saying stuff like that, you, you seize upon it and you absolutely, you definitely use it. Um, then we also bring Fourth Amendment claims, which, you know, the Fourth Amendment isn't particularly strong either anymore. You know, pretty much has been eviscerated by the courts. Um, but, you know, sometimes you bring these cases because you, you really have to based upon principle. And you hope things will, will shake out accordingly. Data, the data that the professor has um, alluded to, um, have been our friend. I mean, sometimes courts will receive that data well, other times not. But certainly, generally speaking, to a, at least to a certain point in the litigation, it can, get, it can take you pretty far. Um, but that really underscores um, the point that David was making. Um, so you should continue to bring your cases. You may win, you may not. Frequently you lose, but that's not the point because you're also educating the public in the meantime. You, have, you are forced, because of the hostility of many courts, to use methods and mechanisms that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily think when you're in law school that you would have to. You think, like David said, this is the law, these are the principles, my facts demonstrate and support that, so I should win. But no, I mean, judges are people too. Um, and they certainly are impacted by the political winds of the time, who may have appointed them, whether they are up for election again, whether they want to move from the federal district court to the court of appeals. I mean, um, and those things I submit um, impact their decision making as well. But I have been forced, given my general area of 
advocating against discrimination to go on TV <laughs> to help lobbyists, um, to talk to newspapers all the time. It's a holistic approach to advocacy, in part, again, because courts have not been as receptive to what I think they should be um, as they could have been. Every once in a while, though, you get a smoking gun. Um, I mean, we have this case now where we're litigating. Um, our clients are uh, one, a retired, decorated police officer, and his brother, who is um, a music professor um, at a college in the Northeast, and they're driving through Ohio in this U-Haul uh, truck moving their, their dead mother's um, belongings um, from the West Coast to the East Coast, and they're stopped supposedly because um, um, uh, I think they, they, uh, the tires crossed the, uh, one of the lanes or something, and the, and the officer initially says, well, I wanted to make sure you weren't falling asleep, but then they wind up getting the drug dogs eventually. They don't find anything on, on them. But um, it was, it's really hard going in these cases. The court was like, you know, this doesn't sound like you've got any kind of a claim here until the officer um, had the audacity to say, I didn't think, in the deposition, I didn't think that the driver was, I thought he was white man. And the guy is my complexion. I mean, that is obviously a lie. And we started to get more traction with the court um, when we were talking about settlement at that point, to the point where the court was like, you know, state, you can claim, you can say you want to file a motion for summary judgment, but I don't really think I'm going to give you permission to do it. Because, and, and he eventually backed down on that, and I'm glad he did, because he, he ought to at least give him a chance. But we're not going to now, have, I don't think, have to worry about being tossed down on summary judgment ground because every once in a while you do get lucky, um, even in these tough cases. And you have to bring them just because of the principle of it. Yeah, but I mean, equal protection law requires intentional discrimination. Unless you get a smoking gun like that, it's very, very hard to prove the case, which is why I think the law needs to be changed along the lines of what I talked about in Michigan. That once a person stopped, what cops typically do, at least if it's a car stop, or even if it's a street stop, then they ask for consent. Because they know they can't just force their way into the car. If that's proven, then they got real problems. And they usually expect to get consent. Why? Because a the person's sitting there saying, well, what happens if I don't consent? I'll be here a lot longer, and maybe something worse will happen. So they get the consent, and then the car is searched. Sometimes something's found. A lot of times, nothing's found. What's happened in Michigan, though, is, as I said before, the prosecutor said, I'm not going to admit into evidence any evidence found as a result of one of these consent searches unless it can be shown there is reasonable suspicion to believe there was contraband in the car. Well, what does that do to the cop? He has to come with, up with articulable reasons as to why he asked for consent. And if all I can say is, well, the guy was black, he's lost. Okay? If all I can say is, nothing about race, but the guy was nervous, he's lost. He has to come up with some articulable reasons in Michigan before there will be any ability to, in, uh, to introduce that evidence. So the import of that law, which unfortunately only exists in Michigan and one or two other, New Jersey also has adopted this idea. It does put a constraint on police, because after all, one reason they do this is to get the contraband. If they can't introduce the contraband, it's not going to do any good. I happen to also believe there should be damages actions in addition, but if we're not going to have those for all the reasons that Reggie mentions, at least change the Fourth Amendment law so that exclusion will be more, have more bite in these situations. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Danica? Well, I mean, I, I have not studied um, that um, that uh, issue very carefully, but I but I do know. My, my first initial reaction was, well, you know, did they profile you know white men with um, with uh, buzz cuts after the Oklahoma City bombing? Well, no, they didn't. But you know, we've all heard stories about the loner kids who are wearing 
who look goth and wear, you know, trench coats getting a hard time now. And, you know, if they're writing, um, drawing cartoons of uh, involving, uh, yeah, they're, they're, get, they're getting, they're getting, you're getting nailed. Um, so I, I do think that's happening at some level. Um, the federal government loves profiling. They pay millions of dollars every year to have people profile all sorts of different kinds of acts. And that was pre-9-11, but now post-9-11, TIA alone costs millions and millions and millions of dollars. Like I said, it was defunded in 2003, partly because some of you heard my lecture on Friday know this, because Admiral Poindexter, who was not real, real smart when it came to PR, he developed an icon which showed an all-seeing eye looking out over the globe and the, and the maxim, <laughs> knowledge is power. You can't imagine a more scary symbol. Uh, with, and even the Republicans, I mean, by a voice, a voice vote, they defunded TIA. The entire Senate <laughs> voted against this because of that icon and what went along with it. But it hasn't stopped TIA-like programs from occurring, and it's based entirely on profiling. Now, mostly terrorist profiles, but not entirely also other kinds of profiles that have to do with what they now call narco-terrorism. It's not really terrorism. It's just narcotic syndicated crime, but they use the word terrorism hyphenated, so it's more likely Congress will fund it if they somehow attach it to terrorism post-2001. It's all based on profiling. I have a couple of friends who make their living off of profiling. All right, thank you. Um, are there any other questions uh, in, the, in the back? The hospital, day of birth, sorry. Um, you probably have more experience um, sort of with, um, you know, with the big picture on that. I'm not totally surprised at all that that happens. I mean, I think, I think we, I think every one of us in this room is affected by race and has race somehow uh, impacting our thinking. And, you know, uh, black folks don't get a pass on that. Um, and so I'm not surprised at all that that's the case. I don't know what it's, the, it's, what. It's police culture. <clears throat> Whoever is a part of that culture is certainly as likely as anyone else um, to engage in profiling. And I think it's important to recognize an aspect of profiling. It, it's common sense, quote unquote. This is passed on from generation to generation of cops. But since race is part of the profile, there's what uh, Bernard Harcourt has called the ratcheting effect. In other words, since African Americanness, so to speak, is part of the profile, they tend to stop African Americans. Well, lo and behold, a certain percentage of them do happen to have drugs, and that confirms what the profile already says. And so it's a self fulfilling prophecy. And so black cops, as well as white cops, say, oh, well, this is right. I mean, African Americans do tend to have drugs or weapons more often than whites. But that's not true as a statistical matter. It's just that the profiles are self-fulfilling prophecies. You're only stopping blacks, so the only people who are going to have drugs or weapons are blacks. That's been it's a real problem. It's been referred to as a perverse illogical profile. And to be clear, um, African American cops stopping other people, we aren't talking about African American cops stopping white people. We're talking about African American cops stopping other African Americans. So, just to be clear, <coughs> African Americanness is the thing that animates a lot of the behavior that we're complaining about tonight. Not everybody, although I listed a number of categories of people who are subjected to racial profiling, we obviously know that not everybody is. Those who are a minority and tend to be disfavored in society are the ones who suffer. All right. Um, we had a hand up over here. Sorry, we're going to have a sec one second. We're going to have another round where we take from the audience, but we're going to get back to the program. Second. But go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. Uh
or because I know you gave us the national statistic, but in that actual area, do they tend to be? Uh, which study you're talking about? Because remember, I talked about the New York study: 175,000 stops, two percent ended up being arrested. Right. Not that one. Not that one. The, the Maryland one, Reggie's case. Um, let me see if I have that. Um, there is some national data on all of this. I'm not sure I know exactly what happened in Maryland. But your question again is... Reggie, you would know this, right? Yeah. I just, well, I need to understand the question. How many times, I mean... My question is, if, if some cops arrested blacks, only blacks or blacks... Agents, yeah, I can give you that. I have that here. So, um, data showed that one-third of all stop drivers had some drugs in the car. And then while drug-free Hispanic and African-American drivers were far more likely to be stopped and searched than drug-free white drivers, a larger minority of the searches of the first two groups, um, African-Americans, by a small margin, uncover substantial quantities of drugs. So African-American and Latino drivers were slightly more likely than whites to have drugs. But remember, they were stopped far more frequently than whites. So you work all that out statistically, and what you're left with was probably whites are more likely to have drugs in their car than African-Americans and Latinos. <clears throat> all right, does that answer your question? All right, we're going to go back to uh, the program, and we're going to switch gears a little bit and get into uh, police abuses, um, police conduct. Uh, post 9-11, there's been an increase in incidences of alleged police abuses, primarily with regard to minorities, ranging from California to New York. Are the courts becoming more tolerant of aggressive police tactics, or have the laws actually been changed, permitting this increased level of aggression? Um, what, what do you think is the explanation for, for that trend? Are they being more lenient towards use of profiling and stop and frisk campaigns and I'm specifically checkpoints and that kind of thing? Abuse where you're getting aggressive with the person that you're taking down, oh. shooting before uh, saying stop, not calling out police officer, um, you know, those things around that line. Well, a lot of it depends on, I mean, when you're talking about um, um, police who uh, shoot or uh, somehow physically injure folks, I mean, the, let's not forget that the prosecutor has a very important role to play here. And in, and in Cincinnati, there have been issues where police officers have not been indicted for, um, you know, uh, engaging in uh, misconduct that um, I think a lot of reasonable people would say should, should have resulted in an indictment. And a lot of that is political. Um, um, uh, so. I think that um, the prosecutor certainly has a role to play in that. Um, it's not just the courts being tolerant or uh, not so tolerant. I'm not sure what it is. Oh, I think that's right. I think it, I think it depends on the court. I think it depends on the jurisdiction. I think it depends on the facts, the prosecutor, whether the community is engaged and will push back. So I think, I think it depends on a lot of Yeah, and as, a, as a general matter, though, it, from what I've observed, um, I haven't looked at the data about this, but from what I've observed in the last uh, several years, I've seen way more increases of, let's say, a black police officer is actually killed while off duty in plain, plain clothes by fellow officers, or uh, the incidents with Sean Bell um, in New York City when he was killed um, trying to leave his engagement party or his bachelor party. Like, I'm not sure that, certainly, is, what I can say is it's certainly not decreasing. I'm not sure if it's increasing so substantially or if that there's more, they were more attuned to it. There, it's publicized more. People are, communities are empowered, so they speak out more. Everybody has a video camera on them and, um, and can expose these things more. I, I certainly think it happens a lot. Whether, but I feel like it's, I feel like it's always happened, though, frankly. Yeah, I guess I, I'm not sure about the premise of the question. It, we don't really have good data on whether there's been an increase in deadly force. You've got to remember that back in the mid-'80s, the Supreme Court actually held in Tennessee versus Garner that the police may not use deadly force uh, unless the individual they're using deadly force against is armed or somehow threatens the officer. And that changed the law, which up until that time allowed the police to use deadly force even when the individual they're using it against was not armed and dangerous. So at least as a matter of law, it should be less likely deadly force is used if only because now the Constitution bars the use of deadly force in some circumstances where it was allowed previously. Now, I don't know if actually police are paying any attention to Tennessee versus Garner, <laughs> but uh, at least theoretically, there should be less deadly force. I will add, though, that in places like L.A., um, there surely has not been a de decrease in the number of lawsuits which allege 
excessive force, not necessarily deadly force, but excessive force by police officers. And LA is pain through the nose um, with respect to these kinds of cases. It has been and still is pain through the nose. So I guess I sort of agree with Reggie. I'm not sure there's been a huge upswing, but I don't think there's been a decrease either. <clears throat> well, it's pretty constant. OK, OK. Accepting that it's constant, I mean, how do you recommend or how do you feel as though this can be changed? I know you say excessive force, but is there a way for the legislator or anyone to stop shooting and then asking questions afterwards? I mean, what, what well, efforts I have one have? suggestion. This is a broken record, but make the cop pay personally. I just got through saying LA pays through the nose. Who's paying that? The department. Cops get indemnified. They don't have to pay a single penny out of their pocket. They are paid, their counsel's paid for. They, if they lose, which they sometimes do, obviously in LA, the department pays the damages. I think if the cop is shown to use excessive force and in any way, shape, or form is in bad faith, they ought to have to pay. And of course, the department also to take appropriate action. That would send a much stronger message. Why aren't they? Um, treated that way. Why is there identification? Because the police departments think, and those of you who have taken my criminal procedure class have heard this terminology before, think that you have to have a certain number of meat eater cops on the force as opposed to grass eater cops, okay? Cops that will go out there and do the dirty work that we all think needs to be done. The meat eaters are the ones that get sued. They're the ones that use excessive force. The department indemnifies them and doesn't necessarily kick them off. Remember Mark Furman, the O.J. Simpson trial? He was horrible. He was um, sued or associated with the suit 44 times, and he was still on the LAPD force. Why? The department thought they needed him. They needed him out there on the front lines to make sure the dirty work was done. We're not going to get rid of those people unless and until they are personally liable, as well as the department having to um, pay through the nose if there's a good faith action right, thank of excessive you. force. So that's one thing to do, not necessarily the only. Um, one more um, round into the audience. Um, okay. Question. So have you looked at how police are rewarded rather than a punitive solution like you proposed? Because it strikes me that um, you know, if you reward prosecutors for convictions, you're going to end up with bad convictions. And if you reward cops you know, for the number of people they stop as opposed to what's effective, you're going to get lots of stops and maybe profiles. Certainly some of them when officer of the month, officer of the year, and it's all driven by how many people quotas. they stop and quotas, and so they can fabricate evidence. I mean, it really is precisely as you have stated. It's, it's, there's a built-in incentive for doing the things that we're complaining about tonight because they, even they get, you know, the adulation and admiration of their peers. And, they're, you know, they stop the most people. They've gotten the most... They've, you know, found the most drugs or whatever, but they get, and I don't know if there's a, a monetary component to the, um, you know, if they get paid for it as well, but they, they certainly are incentivized to do these things because it's part, again, of the police culture. For the bigger and better you are, um, you know, the more you're going to be appreciated and respected. And um, so, but, but I, your, your question is well taken. Yeah, I, I love the question because what it, what it um, demonstrates is just how critical it is to bring a problem-solving approach to these very complex issues. Um, and I would encourage all of you, when you become um, practitioners, to really bring that out-of-the-box problem-solving approach, because that, that's what can make the, can these issues a little bit better. I mean, it's not going to solve it, but it, it can move it um, along in the right direction. I've seen many officer of the month and officer of the year like documents when I've gotten discovery. I mean, they really are um, given benefits. But, you know, essentially. Collars, scalps, however you want to put Collars it. is the word they use. Yeah. The number of collars gets you officer of the month. Yeah. And it doesn't really matter how the collars happen. Now, if you beat the guy to death, that might get you in trouble. But anything short of that, if it's a collar, then that's good. It helps your badass reputation, too, I mean. Now, Albert Quick has written an interesting article where he suggests 
One way of counteracting that is rewarding cops for good collars as opposed to bad collars. It might be very hard to institute that kind of regime, but he actually has a number of practical suggestions. Think, David mentioned thinking out of the box. This is one thing using basic reward and punishment principles. You reward cops for good collars, meaning collars that adhere to the Fourth Amendment, that don't involve excessive force, that don't involve racial profiling, and so on. And then another sort of benefit is that you get promoted and then get invited to go teach other people how to do what you've done. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, one more question. Sorry, one more question. Um, I guess for the past three, four years, um, local law enforcement in many communities have been empowered by the federal government to um, enforce our national immigration laws through the 287G program, which allows and asks officers on the street not only to identify who is an immigrant, but who came across the border without the proper papers. And I'm wondering what your experience has been um, in how the 287G program has changed the mindset of officers in carrying out that policy, um, and also what impact it's had on the community in terms of tolerance for or intolerance of that kind of profile. Uh, oh, okay. I, I, let me just speak briefly to it. Um, it is in in, this, in Ohio, and particularly in a county that's um, uh, adjacent to the county where I live in. It has been a license for harassing, um, on a nonstop basis, immigrants in our community. Um, and just recently, to compound it, um, the state uh, DMV said that if you um, can't prove that you are here legally, you can't even register your car, and there are all sorts of policy issues with that. And so now, you combine these very aggressive uh, police tactics to um, ferret out uh, folks who might be here illegally, and then folks not even now able to drive, and they're just, it, it is just awful. And so the mindset, um, what it's what it's done is it's is it's really um, uh, there's a very uh, he likes to consider himself law and order sheriff uh, in Butler County. I'm What's sorry, that? Well, oh, the like it. Well, you're thinking of the one in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, Joe he, he he likes to think of himself as the Joe Ohio of <laughs> of, of um, Ohio, focused on ridding, as he would put it. I would not put it that way. Ridding the community of immigrants. So I, I think it's very problematic, and it's it's an area where we're now starting to focus a lot more of our resources um, into trying to counteract in some way. And I think the public. Um, is for the most part because it's not getting all of the information um, it's getting a very biased account of it is very supportive of what uh, what local law enforcement is doing and I cannot emphasize enough how it is important to change the conversation um, litigation only gets you so far you've got to be we've got to be hitting in the media and um, in finding the right people, as Reggie was saying earlier, to speak out and to build coalitions to address this issue. The only thing I would add to that is that I totally agree. It's, ab it's absolutely pervasive. It's all not just in Ohio, not just in Arizona. It's really all around the country. And police departments get paid to do this. So they, there's a monetary incentive for taking on these 287G programs. Um, and the impact on the public is that the public supports it. And, and the, the one thing that I wanted to tweak a little bit about what David said is that um, it, it isn't just immigrants, right? It's American citizens, too, who happen right. to be of Hispanic or Latino descent who are now regarded with suspicion, even though their citizenship is no less than mine or yours. But they're now suspicious um, because of, of their sort of national origin, if you will. One twist I want to add to this is that one possible litigation strategy is to make a federalism argument against what's going on. Because even though it is pervasive nationally, there are some locales that hate 287G. Because even though the federal government does provide some money, it's, it's halfway to being an unfunded mandate. Because a lot of these police departments have to devote a whole lot of resources to this program that they don't get totally reimbursed for. So uh, in sort of an ironic way, litigators like David and Reggie could argue there's a constitutional problem here um, along the lines of unfunded, being an unfunded funded med, uh, mandate that conceivably could put a stop to a program um, that you really want to put a stop to for other reasons, the racial profiling. And, and with the conser conservative courts, that would yes, have exactly, some traction. Exactly so right. that's an mm -hmm. argument that's very attractive. Mm -hmm. right.
you know, the, <clears throat> the financial economic sort of, you know, status of many states is to be in poor condition. Um, states are suffering financially, in other words. And ironically, um, in Texas, for example, the conservative legislators are the ones who help pass, um, for example, uh, laws that would reduce the number of prisons being built and so on, and people sent to prison, et cetera, because it costs a lot of money. So you really can get traction when you bring in the, the financial component in these really struggling communities. And in Ohio, we got a similar dynamic going on right now, just to make a quick point, and it's the Democrats who are fighting it because they don't want to be painted as soft on crime. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it, these, are, these issues cut across uh, political lines, um, although you may think they don't. They do. Um, one last question. Um, well, not one last question, actually. I came across an interesting statistic about uh, the Florida prison system, actually. It said that 60% uh, of the people that populate the Florida prison system are African American, while only 10% of them are populate, take up the actual population of Florida. Um, could you, do you have any theories as to the sentencing issues as to why there are so many African Americans in jail versus the, the amount that actually commit the crimes. This may be out of the scope. Of I, I think it. I think um, we, we've taken we've taken a look at at um, similar statistics in Ohio. What we're finding is that the discrepancies are not happening for the most part um, at sentencing. Um, the judges and we were a little bit surprised by this. We thought that we were going to find that judges were treating um, white and black defendants differently. And that didn't really bear it, bear it out. But what, what it does indicate, we think, and I think this would bear um, out in Florida as well, is that at the front end, in terms of like who's getting um, targeted by the police, what the charging decisions are by the prosecutor, that that's where you see um, a lot of um, the discrepancy. Oh, you, so from the prosecutor is where it really starts. Police, well, police, 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 oh, yeah. police before, and then and then and then the prosecutors um, also contribute to that. And there's been um, there's been a lot of good work that um, the Vera Institute of Justice is doing in New York. Uh, Wayne McKenzie is a um, a prosecutor there um, who is being who's working trying to work with uh, prosecutor offices around the country for those offices to actually measure. Um, uh, their, you know, wh whether they are charging in, in, in a racially discriminatory way. And, you know, his argument to the prosecutors is that, look, this can be a tool for you, um, you know, to, to the extent you care about politics. I mean, if you bring in, we do this study, and whether we find, is you know, find issues or not, you can at least be proactive and address And that can give you, uh, buy you a lot of support. Um, in communities um, that don't trust you. So um, I'm hoping that more of that's going to be happening because as I think one of the themes that we've been hitting hard tonight is that evidence really does matter and folks need to be looking at, it, at their charging decisions and um, seeing whether there's bias there. Um, and you know, if, there's, if there's evidence of it, change it. I would only add <clears throat> to David's statement that even before even in schools, when you talk about the school to prison pipeline, um, where kids of color are being disproportionately sent to the principal's office, suspended, sent to alternative school, introduced into the juvenile and criminal justice system, those disparities, you know, at the very front of the system, end up with disparities on the very end of the system, but people, but people of color disproportionately represented. Uh, in prison. So it starts very young, unfortunately, very early on. Um, and many people sort of conspire, if you will, to get that end result. Um, okay. yeah, one thing I would say in response, particularly to the Florida data, um, is that, of course, one reason we have these kinds of panels and we're worried about racial profiling is that discretion is available in many different parts of the system. In Florida, interestingly enough, they have what's called determinate sentencing, which means that the, the sentence range the judge, that is available to the judge is pretty narrow. The judge, in other words, has very little discretion. What does that mean? 
All the discretion gets squeezed to the prosecutor and the police, and so that's where you see the discrimination. In jurisdictions that have indeterminate sentencing, I wouldn't be at all surprised if you saw a lot more abusive discretion at sentencing as well as with prosecutors and police. So the, the, the lesson that might be learned from this is that, that limiting discretion can limit the impact of race on decision making. Florida might be proof of that. <clears throat> okay. And we'll take some questions from the audience before we close. Yes. Reggie. Florida, I mean. I was equating appearance with race or ethnicity, and so I will never ever support that. Um, and my problem with the my problem with what you describe is still it doesn't it, it cast the net too broadly, and it's going to bring in people who may like the bright colors of a gang that they're wearing, who might think they're trying to be cool because they, they want a tattoo. It could be a fake tattoo. Who knows? Maybe they're doing it to protect themselves. And I mean, to the extent that the, the net is cast so broadly that it really doesn't improve your hit rate or the, you know, the, the rate at which someone is guilty of something that you think they are, um, then, I, then I, wouldn't, I wouldn't support it. I, I think that you run the risk of bringing in too many, in, too many innocent people simply because you're based on... Again, and so I, I turn again to behavior. And just because of how you look or dress, I think is not sufficient um, indicia of criminality. And if you think about, oh, I'm sorry, I mean, I'm done, I'm done. And if you think about the baggy pants phenomenon, I mean, I mean, there's so many people who wear baggy pants. I mean, it's certainly not all of them are. <laughs> it, I, it's conceivable that gang regalia in combination with certain behaviors would give you enough suspicion to stop an individual and question them. But if the suggestion is having gang regalia means the police can do something to the individual, you're basically allowing the police to harass anyone with gang regalia on their person. And again, there's some innocent reasons for having that. There may even be some not so innocent reasons. In fact, they actually are gang members. But does that mean that you can stop and harass them just based on that fact? The Supreme Court of the United States in Chicago versus Morales has said no. Uh, back in whenever it was, I can't remember exactly when the case was decided, there was a Chicago ordinance which held that it was permissible to arrest a, mem a person who the police had probable cause to believe was a gang member and who failed to disperse when the police asked them to disperse. And the Supreme Court of the United States held that that was an unconstitutional ordinance for the kinds of reasons that Reggie and David are talking about. Now, I might disagree with that opinion, but if this Supreme Court is willing to say that, yeah. then you've got a problem. <clears throat> Right, because I mean, because you, you can be a gang member and simply want to take your child to school. Should somebody stop you because he... Really and of course, the reason for Morales is the, the potential abuses of discretion that can occur. <clears throat> Any more? Tracy. And race is one of the right. factors. Well, they, they know that it was African American age, I think the courts find less of a problem with that. Um, and we, we don't necessarily, the description is very specific and reliable and limited as to geography and other limiting factors, then we are not necessarily considering that to be racial profile. Um, and, I, and I think courts agree that. I mean, the problem, though, is that you can abuse that. 
you can, like, in the town of Oneonta, New York, stop literally every black person in the town because of a suspect description. So there is, it's not without limit, but generally speaking, it's, it's less offensive, I think, to courts and maybe even advocates against racial profile. Well, let me, can I throw out a, a counter um, uh, hypothetical, so to speak? Let's, let's say that um, there is a purse snatching that happens. Uh, the description of the purse snatcher, the only description that's given is um, black male wearing uh, dark clothing and a black hoodie, okay? A hooded sweatshirt. Um, the police stop a six foot seven black man um, 11 minutes after this in the same neighborhood um, who's not wearing a hoodie. Um, do you think that that's appropriate? What do you think? What do you think a court would do with that? Say that the police were right to stop this guy. <laughs> black male, black hoodie, and this is a an area where there are lots of black folks around. Same height, just the the, the absence of the hoodie is what you're saying. Yeah, and it, well, no 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 height description. Oh no height. No height description. I'm sorry. Okay. He happens to be six foot seven. There's no mention of somebody that's unusually tall. <laughs> well, this is a case that we had at our office. We have a, a law school clinic that runs out of our office and it was one of our student cases. And at Dargon Court, found that the police were well within uh, it, uh, it, its rights to stop um, our client um, and would not suppress the evidence. And the ev he was not the, the purse snatcher, by the way. Uh, what happened was he, um, in the back of the police car, they asked him what his social security number was, and he was one uh, number off. And they charged him with falsification, and we were trying to suppress the statements um, based on that. And at that oral argument, the um, uh, several judges were just you know, like, what are the police officers to do? What are they to do? And we had lots of answers to that, but they didn't care. They didn't listen. My point is that this stuff is like, it's hard. It's, it's charged. Um, racially, it's charged. It's charged in terms of um, the politics of wanting to be tough on crime and supporting the police. And that's an absurd result. That's an absurd result. Um, there's so many things the officer could have done. If he, it, you know, first of all, he didn't fit the limited description of the clothing, but you know what? Why not radio back and, and ask for some sort of uh, information about the height? Because that's unusual. Six foot seven is tall. Trust me, I'm short. I stood next to him. That's tall. <laughs> um, so that was a real uh, kick in the stomach when we got, um, we got that decision, and the Ohio Supreme Court wouldn't take it up, and it's just. All right, thank you, David. We're going to have one last question posed to the panelists, and then we're going to call this. Um, let's see, the first question, or the last question, will be, at what point does prosecutorial discretion rise to the level of federal intervention, and realistically, what can the federal government do to stop an abuse such as what occurred in the Gina 6 situation? And without going back over the facts of Gina 6, um, what level of prosecutorial discretion do we allow before the federal government just says this is just blatant racism and do you When should the federal government be able to intervene in a state prosecution based on a racial discrimination claim? Like a direct violation of the Constitution. That, I mean, that, I know it's very... That's a very weighted question because there's so many different issues involved there in addition to racial discrimination. I, I, or to make it less complicated, state. The, instead of the federal government, the, the state legislator coming in saying this is just wrong on all levels. I mean, I'm always persuaded if he, the situation is so heinous that you can't look away from it. Um, and therefore, it might necessitate federal or higher state intervention. Or um, if there's a pattern. If there's a pattern of this prosecutor acting wrongly, discriminatorily, abusing her or his discretion repeatedly, then um, it, it, might, it might warrant um, the intervention of the federal government. 
intervention of the federal government, the DOJ, or a state, a state legislative body. Okay. Is anyone? Maybe disbarment of the prosecutor after the fact, if not before. And that's what happened with the Duke Cross case, which is maybe uh, obviously it's a reverse kind of situation we've been talking about all evening, but that's what happened there. <clears throat> all right. And uh, all right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for attending the panel discussion. Um, a round of applause for our panelists, please.